Welcome to From the Quarries. I think tonight I might have suffered from a bit of overreach with the topic of the video Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. The publication of the three Rosicrucian manifestos in Germany between 1614 and 1616 has been a topic of fascination for me for as long as I can rem remember, at least 20 or 30 years. And I hubristically thought that it would be easy enough to toss off a video looking at the relationship between Rosicrucianism, specifically the Manifestos, and Freemasonry. But of course, the more I read and the more I researched, the bigger the topic became. And I quickly realised it's just not possible to do justice to this topic in one video. So tonight I'll be presenting two short papers. The first is an introduction to the Rosicrucian Manifestos for those who may not be too familiar with the topic, which was written by Gian Giuseppe Philippi. The copy I have of this paper is undated. The second section is an extract from a fascinating book called The Beginning of Masonry by Frank C. Higgins, which was published in 1916 and is entitled Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. There is just so much more that I could cover on this topic, so please let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more. I do have a fascinating work by Arthur Edward Waite, giving the history of the Order of the Rosy and Golden Cross, which I think would make a great video, so let me know if you'd like to hear more. Anyway, here's tonight's video. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation from the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. In 1614, in Kassel, Wilhelm Wessel's printing house published a book in German, The Pharma Fraternitatis. It tells the story of a friar called C.R., an impoverished nobleman and German monk who travelled to the Holy Land, heading first to Damascus with the intention of reaching Jerusalem. He fell ill in Damascus, where he became known for his ability in the medical art. He got in contact with local doctors, and after a while, he lost interest in Jerusalem and begged them to take him to the town of Damkar. There he was generously welcomed by the wise men and doctors. In the story of the farmer, Damkar appears as if it were a republic of sages, a sort of utopia. However, its location is unclear. C.R. stayed there for three years, learning the wonders of the Book of Nature taught by the philosophers of Damkar. During his stay, he translated into German the mysterious Lieber M, which later became the reference text for his followers. Once he was fully instructed, C.R. was sent to the city of Fez in Morocco, to a circle of wise men closely connected with those of Damkar. About this second stage of instruction, the farmer informs us that in Fez, C.R. refined his knowledge in magic Kabbalah, medicine, and philosophy. What he learned from the sages of Fez was a superior Kabbalah, which he adopted to the Christian religion in a form more appropriate to its origins. In this manner, he learned a science that allowed him to understand and harmonize all the fields of knowledge. After two years, C.R. left for Spain. Here, he exposed his knowledge to local scholars, but they were irreparably infected by the Catholic prejudices still following the teachings of Porphyry, Aristotle and Galen. So he left for Germany. There, he found true intellectuals who enthusiastically embraced his teachings and the content of the mysterious Lieber M. In the beginning, three brothers joined C.R., and they all travelled the streets of Germany, bestowing the blessings of their knowledge. Their clothes did not distinguish them from other Germans. They introduced themselves as doctors, and they treated their patients free of charge. 
In addition, the farmer tells us that those first four brothers developed a magical written and spoken language in which they compiled a dictionary of all wisdom. They used to gather in a building called the Sancti Spiritus. After a few years, they doubled their number, and later on, the organization counted 36 members. Their aim was to increase scientific knowledge in order to improve the living conditions of the time and, by performing prodigies, to change the antiquated mentality still prevailing in Europe. After the death of the first of the brothers, C.R. took care to build for himself a tomb in a secret place, full of allegorical meanings and filled with books and wonderful objects. C.R. predicted that for 120 years his tomb would remain concealed. But, after that period of time, his successors should have started to interfere in European events, revealing their presence as an invisible college. The farmer goes on to describe the miraculous discovery of the tomb of C.R. in 1604. The description of the tomb is a lengthy allegory in which mathematical and geometrical symbols are associated to the presence of the library of the late founder of the Liber M and the prodigious automata that was somewhere in between magic and mechanics. The conclusion of the Libellus includes a utopian plan of magic, scientific, universal improvement. In a few words, a religion devoid of dogmas, rites, hierarchies, and which was inclusive of pagan, Kabbalistic, and alchemical wisdom. The following year, 1615, a second manifesto, published by the same printing house, appeared, this time written in Latin. This is known as the Confessio Fraternitatis, and it was obviously addressed to the educated classes. It comprises a series of statements of faith and descriptions of a universal plan of reformation, a reformation generically Protestant, and therefore rooted mostly in the Old Testament. In fact, from the very beginning, Jehovah is invoked as Lord of the imminent Sabbath. However, this God, called by his Hebrew name, is intended as the guarantor of the becoming of nature, and through its phenomena he would manifest himself to the wise men, and through calamities he would punish the wicked. Since the appearance of the Pharma Fraternitatis had been received with understandable hostility by the orthodox circles, the Confessio had a cautious outset. So that no one may accuse us of the slightest heresy, nor of following evil principles, nor of plotting against temporal power, we condemn the East and the West, the Pope and Muhammad, who are blasphemers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we offer, with good faith, our prayers, our secrets, and our great golden treasures to the supreme head of the Roman Empire. What the meaning of the ambiguous formula supreme head of the Roman Empire is, is unclear. Why use the formula supreme head of the empire instead of the more common title of emperor? The answer to this question will be provided by examining the third and last manifesto. The content of the Confessio also lists the ideals that the reform plan should have implemented. Religious tolerance among the various Protestant sects and Judaism, and the currents of free thought. Benign use of magic, increased use of the sciences, especially mathematics and mechanics. Support for the arts, particularly the allegorical and utopian ones. Economic and social development for the well-being of all. All these innovations and discoveries were intended, above all, to create a change of mentality in order to erase all memory of the medieval ecumenical Europe. The document recommends the foundation of a free zone in Europe, that it should be governed only by wise men. In order to achieve this, it was necessary to spread the use of free, individualistic examination of the Bible, and thus freeing its reading from any magisterium. These first two manifestos explicitly invited all those who were interested in the magic, scientific reform of Europe 
presented here as a new universal religion to make contact with the brothers. The third document, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, appeared in Strasbourg in 1616, published anonymously like the two previous manifestos. In this work, the meaning of the different acronyms presented in the previous manifestos was the first for the first time revealed. The novel narrates the marriage of two princes, which Christian Rosenkreutz would be invited to in their enchanted castle, a place full of magical wonders and animated mechanisms. The wedding ceremony lasted a week. Every day, Rosenkreutz had to go through various experiences lavishly described by mysterious allegories, obscure symbols, and elusive theatrical performances. The intent was to represent the seven steps of some not well-defined hermetic Kabbalistic initiation. The week-long ceremonies ended with the ordination of Rosenkreutz and the other guests as Knights of the Golden Stone Order. The arcane atmosphere of the farmer and the confessio was immediately successful in the late Renaissance occult circles of Protestant Europe. Many personalities of the secular Protestant culture tried to get in touch with the mysterious members of the Fraternitatis. Since the manifestos did not indicate any contact details, the publishing houses were stormed, first and foremost the Wilhelm Wessel House, which had published both the farmer and the confessio. Subsequently, other publishing houses were also subject to urgent requests for contact. Since no one answered these demands, some of the seekers had the idea of publishing booklets by the very same printing houses with requests for admission to the Fraternitatis, or at least for an epistolatory contact. But all was in vain. As often happens in pseudo-initiatic environments, the lack of answers was not considered a reason, either of disappointment or of suspicion. Keeping their own origins mysterious, not revealing the name of the masters, concealing an overt doctrine behind abstruse symbols and allegories, invincibly attracts those who wish to be deceived. Everyone had referred to the enigmatic acronym CR until the book of The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz appeared, and finally revealed the name of the founder and the title of the Fraternitatis Rosicruciana. After having recognised Christian Rosenkreutz as Brother C.R., it will now be appropriate to give a more detached look at the farmer Fraternitatis. The main character went to the town of Damkar in Arabia, a name that does not exist in that region, where he was expected as a predestined pupil. There he learned magic, Kabbalah, medicine and philosophy. He then moved to Fez, where another community of sages taught him a superior Kabbalah, which he later adapted to his Christian religion. The Confessio, for its part, confirms those data. Those who live in the city of Damkar of Arabia have a political and social order completely different from that of the other Arabs, a kind of order that C.R. should have exported to Europe. The masters belong to those communities in Islamic lands, and their Rosicrucian Protestant disciples, they both practiced the art of medicine. They wore the clothes of the countries they visited, and not those that would have identified them as belonging to another community. In the farmer, the Kabbalah is mentioned four times, and twice in the Confessio, and both manifestos speak ill of the Pope and Muhammad calling them heretics and blasphemers. Therefore, it is quite evident that the Rosicrucians did not go to the East to receive the teachings from the Sufis. It is unknown what the meaning of the name Damkar is. What is certain is that between Damascus and Jerusalem there is the city of Safed. In the 16th century, the city was the seat of Kabbalistic Messianic school of Rabbi Isaac Luria, this closely relates to the mystical devo deviation of the ancient Jewish initiation created by Abulafia 
and it is from this school that in the 17th century came the false messiah, Shabbatai Sevi. The town of Safed obtained a wide autonomy from the Ottoman Empire. Even today, that city on the Lake Tiberias is considered the capital of the messianic apocalyptic Kabbalah. We frequently hear of an alleged connection between Freemasonry and so-called Rosicrucianism brotherhoods. In the course of the last couple of centuries, there have been many hundred claims set up to the title of society or fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Any brother who feels inclined to dip into the question of extinct Masonic rites and degrees, by a short course of Mackey's Masonic Encyclopedia, will be if not already informed, astonished to find that all the masonry we are officially aware of today is but a mere fragment of that that has at one time or another figured as of impressive importance to the craft. In the archives of the Scottish Rite, there are preserved evidences of the voluntary abdications of a number of imposing Masonic rites that once enjoyed high favour and numerous membership but which eventually dissolved under pressure of internal dissensions and the larger hope embodied in the rise of a body so constituted as to obviate the possibility of unbecoming strife and other weaknesses. At the present moment, the empty dignities and now meaningless powers of obsolete rights are occasionally heard of as passed from hand to hand for trifling money considerations wherever a gull can be induced to believe that he is receiving high Masonic degrees, even though the same may be conferred upon him by a single individual, by virtue of the powers, etc., in a basement dining room or a hall bedroom. The chief significance that attaches itself to the revival of interest in Rosicrucians lies in the fact that, according to the strict spirit of the ancient brotherhood, there can be but one organisation in existence entitled to their name and secrets. And that organisation never had, nor, it is claimed, never will have any public or exoteric existence. It is not the sort of club or society that has offices, holds public or even private meetings, and elects eligible persons to memberships. The true Rosicrucian may never meet another of his mystic order on the physical plane. He is not initiated in a hall or chapter room after having paid a fee, but it is made known to him by occult means that he has been found worthy of admission into this literal band of immortals, and thereafter he is shown how to pro project his perceptions onto a higher plane, upon which it is possible for him to meet no and commune with all his fellow members, who assemble like witches upon a sabbat, in a twinkling of an eye, by merely willing to do so, no matter where their physical bodies may happen to be sojourning. In fact, the first public gossip concerning the Rosicrucians and their wonderful powers began to be bruited about at the beginning of the 17th century. Membership in the fraternity was attributed to various alchemists by the herd, and claimed by numerous charlatans on the other hand. Many tales are told of the discovery of weird underground vaults in otherwise desert places, which upon being opened were found to be brilliantly illuminated by perpetually burning lamps, that is to say, until it's extinguished by the admission of outer air. These were said to have been the secret meeting places of the Rosicrucians. From the very nature of Rosicrucianism as described, however, that of tradition must necessarily be spurious, as the mere fact of publicity, upon however private or restricted a scale, is sufficient to stamp it as such. The existence of Rosicrucianism might be claimed, and certain highly endowed scholars and scientists be suspected, nay, openly charged, with being members of its charmed circle, but no genuine record exists 
of any ancient Rosicrucian society upon which any theory of continuity might be based by a modern group of students of the occult. There is quite a successful modern Rosicrucian society in London, the moving spirit of which was the late Dr. Wynne Westcott, former coroner for the County of Middlesex. As a research body, disinterring many interesting legends about the reputed Rosicrucians of the Middle Ages, this latter-day society has done good work. It all sums up in the state of mind of the person most interested. An old Potsdam pensioner once wrote King Frederick the Great in much distress over the suppression of a military decoration, the only one he had ever received. The king smilingly wrote on the margin of the complaint, Pensioner X has herewith our royal permission to wear all the abolished decorations he likes. Just as the evolutionary process through which all organic beings have arrived from lower forms to present high states of de development may be traced in the structures of those beings themselves, so the structure of any mystical order claiming extraordinary antiquity will reveal the foundation of its claims to the student, irrespective of any personal contentions. Our own craft has hardly departed from the use of ancient monitors and lectures connecting masonry with the beginnings of the human race. Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Moses, and other patriarchs, which had become a laughing stock among our strenuous modernists. When it begins to transpire that the structure of Freemasonry is superior to her traditions, and that he who knows masonry structurally will have no difficulty whatever in comprehending all these curious connections as apt and purposeful. When this knowledge becomes more common to the fraternity, we shall be in a position to understand the difference between that which guarantees the genuineness of our, our own antiquity and the claims that any mystical brotherhood may at present set up of surpassing age, royal descent, and the possession of the fundamental arcana of the universe. Without the average Mason's being able to prove that his pretensions have any greater value than those of the newcomer.